Hello. Hello. Thanks for coming. Um, it's good to see a lot of people actually um, that we don't know because it means you're not obliged to come. We wouldn't force you to come. So thanks for coming along. Um, obviously, like without you guys buying tickets, this wouldn't really mean a lot. So uh, thank you very much for being interested and thanks for uh, coming along to listen to these really interesting speakers that we've got today. A um, few housekeeping and order of ceremony that Taylor would describe to you now. Yep, so I'll do the boring stuff. Um, so, uh, obviously, like, put your hands on silent. Um, we're going to ask the individual speakers whether they'd like uh, questions throughout or questions at the end, but I think most people probably want them at the end. Um, but we'll get them to clarify the use in the end. Um, I think that's about it. We're going to have, like, kind of 15 minute breaks between speakers if all runs on time. But there will be breaks anyway, so, like, if you need the toilet or whatever. Um, and the talks are going to be around kind of half an hour, so I shouldn't be too much of chewing and throwing. Um, so the speakers are as follows. So we have uh, Dr. Moon here talking to us about mental health and the LGBT community first up, uh, and that's going to be uh, until kind of 2.45. Uh, then we'll have Professor Richard Morris talking about virtual reality and mental health, um, and that'll be kind of 3 to 3.30, 3.45. Um, we have Dr. Sally Marlow talking to us about alternative views on recreational drugs. Um, that will be kind of around 4 to 4.30. Uh, and then Dr. Elaine Hunter talking about dissociation and participation to finish off. Um, so that should finish around 5. Uh, and then we're going to go over to Maple House to the common room. Uh, it's not far away. Uh, and have some nibbles and wine. As well. And we should have someone that you can follow if you don't know where that is. Yeah. Um, that will just kind of lead you all in an exodus over there. Yeah. Um, and yeah, sorry, we didn't actually mention the title of the conference right at the start. Yeah. It's a bit of an error. This is Mind Beyond the Masters. Um, so it's a conference that um, was sort of really well supported by the staff on the Masters um, and also kind of led by uh, some of the students to create it. And we, all, we invited the speakers. Um, none of them really, um, they were doing this for free basically. Yeah. So really <laughs> grateful for them coming along and doing this. Yeah. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to my lovely colleague Lisa, who's going to introduce the first speaker. Thanks for coming. And enjoy. Hi, so as um, Joe said, we've kind of all picked someone and invited them. And so I picked Lindsay Moon here, um, a senior, senior lecturer at Roehampton University in the Department of Psychology. Don't know who's swerving. Um, she is presently working in trans and non binary research and activism. Um, if you look her up, so much activism. It's amazing. So impressive. Um, she's also involved in researching social meaning of emotions and and that relation to gender and sexuality. Um, she's edited two books focusing on gender, emotion, and sexuality, and she's recently been involved with the Memora Memorandum of Understanding Against Conversion Therapy for LGB and um, more recently trans and non-gender binary people. Um, it's presently in operation, and she's attended um, a meeting at the Department of Health for representatives of UKCP and Pink Therapy with MP Jane Ellison to make a case for inclusion. So now she's going to give a little speech and tell us more about what she's working on. Thank you. Um, so, um, well, I got this call from Lisa, and, um, oh, hello, sorry, just to say hello, to the room, just a joke in like that, and hopefully it's going to be a little bit interesting, I don't know if it will be, I'm not quite sure exactly whether the topic is exactly what you were expecting, but anyway, we'll just have to see how it goes. I would prefer if questions are at the end, but if you really feel like you really have to say something, then just feel <laughs> like, what well, I don't want your neck. Oh, 
think my phone did my accident actually. Well, <laughs> 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 yeah, just, just, just very calm. Hey, do you want to pop it outside? Don't go to the door, do you? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you yeah. probably need to kill me, but... <laughs> <laughs> I think it's in shock of the mother. Thank you for telling me that. We're just there. <laughs> we probably won't know if he's really not. <laughs> he could have been part of the... afternoon. <laughs> 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 so anyway, um, let's, just, uh, let's just carry on. Um, one of the things was not having heard anything about LGBT or LGBTQ, or even now LGBTQIA, uh, depending on what to go through. So um, if you haven't had anything about that, which you might have little bits and pieces, I really don't know, but let, I, I, I put on that, or how to be quietly violent, and you see, it's, it's, you'll, you'll see why I put that on as, as we go along. Um, and it's not meant to be um, offensive, it's just a thoughtful statement. So I want you to just think about um, what does it mean then if we haven't had any, any work on a, a particular area. Um, and Eli Clare says, of course, it's one of the profound ways in which oppression works. Mm -hmm. Tamaya was in body hatred. Uh, homophobia is all about defining queer bodies as wrong, perverse, immoral. Transphobia about defining trans bodies as unnatural, monstrous, or the product of delusion. Ableism. Uh, about defining disabled bodies as broken and tragic, class warfare about defining bodies of workers as expendable, racism about defining bodies of people of colour as primitive, exotic, or worthless, and sexism about defining female bodies as playable objects. The question is, how do these messages sink beneath the skin? And I suppose my work is in counselling psychology and in psychotherapy, and has been now for a very long time. So part of the work that I do is questioning how some of these things sink below the skin and what does it actually mean um, for the people uh, when that happens. The question is, you know, like, what does it really matter if we haven't really done anything about LGBTQI or A? What, does it, what will it mean about um, the way that you think about your findings in your research? What will it mean about the way that you form treatment pathways or diagnose or form categories, what types of therapy or autism, um, how you work with a multidisciplinary team? Uh, what does it mean about how we incorporate maybe all those different groups? What does it mean about you? What does it mean about why you're here, how you got here, how you'll stay here, what you'll go out and do, how did you pay to get here, how did you actually uh, manage to stay on the course, what does it mean about your age, what does it mean about your heritage, all of these things really come in to these very statements about how we position ourselves in the world of work and research and um, in my case counselling psychology. Uh, and as in re uh, research, when I do research at Warwick, and for you it will mean wherever this, this particular course is going to take you. So because you haven't actually maybe done a great deal, and I can't really do a, a sort of a global analysis of, of exactly what's, what's going on, but I, I will come to some examples and I'll do it more specific in a moment. That's sort of a, a sort of a, a, a squashed up history, if you like, because you see, Within the, the, the work that I do is never really, um, you know, we can't divorce the political uh, from um, and the social from the idea of what constitutes the person who says that they are heterosexual or lesbian or gay or bisexual or queer or trans or bigender or gender pan gender, uh, demi boys, queer boys, whatever it is that people name themselves as. It, we can't turn around and just go, go, oh, well, that's just the way it sort of is. It, it's, 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 if you look at that, uh, then what, what I mean to show is that the 50s were this sort of line, not only did the emergence of uh, neoliberalism probably start in the 1950s, with something like Milton social change that had a massive impact on the lives of many people, including at that time, um, people that identified as lesbian and gay. And the lesbian and gay movement really started in America, in, I mean, look, it's arguable, but 
in some cases, the, the uh, people who set up uh, the formation of a lesbian and gay rights. But of course, you have McCarthyism as a backdrop and this interrogation of the other. And therefore, you have this idea of also emerging with this, like, the, the, this idea of things moving from people as bodies, people fighting for citizenship and civil, civil rights, into what exactly are you? What caused you to be like this? Why are you this? And lesbian and gay became very much wrapped up with this essentialist sort of idea that there are bodies. I am lesbian and I am gay. I am this very thing, homosexual categories. And at the same time, in psychology, you had the emergence of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual um, from the American Psychiatric Association and the International Classification of Diseases. Uh, you had homosexuality as a category, and the shift into therapies that were about conversion, aversion, reversion. Uh, so shock therapies were around, and behaviorism was around. And then we move into that 70s up to the 90s. You can, you can see, so you know, by the 1970s and the 90s, we've got this bigger idea. You've got social movements. You've got people who want to actually shift into identity politics. You've got this idea of the push to get uh, to move DSM out of the way in terms of creating homosexuality as a mental illness, and uh, not not that it did it completely because it did shift around labels a little bit. But therapists were still struggling a little bit at that time. And as we moved towards the end of the 70s into the 80s, uh, through the removal of DSM as uh, seeing uh, homosexuality as a mental illness, you've got that idea of affirmative therapies and the idea that issues begin to emerge. The idea that we could, for the first time, actually begin to speak about feeling the way that we felt the way that actually what it was like to talk about relationships, to talk about children. A, a gay affirmative, a gay affirming sort of way began to be to, to emerge. And research, of course, equally was shifted. You know, in the in the area of sociology, you have things like grounded theory, the idea of theories embedded in the uh, in the um, narratives of people. Well, it, not so much narratives then actually, but in the in the way people were. So it, it wasn't trying to look at essentialisms, it was looking at things like Mary McIntosh's The Homosexual Role, that sexuality was a role that was acted out. Uh, not so much acted out, but um, it was constructed, it was put together. The meaning of what constitutes heterosexual, um, and these are relatively sort of new words in some ways, and what constitutes the homosexual were really the social mores were saying how to actually uh, go about that. So um, uh, by the 1990s, of course, we've, we've therapists obviously still struggling around that time, but affirmative work was coming through. If you look at the Pink Therapy book series that Dominic Davis and Charles Neal did, you'll find some nice examples, A, of the history, B, of uh, gay affirmative therapies, how actually uh, 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 people sort of work with LGB, LGB claims predominantly, actually, and bisexuality creating this sort of little space of problematic thinking in some ways, you know, uh, what, does that, what does this actually mean in terms of identity and gender and sexuality and sexed bodies. But basically, the 1990s onwards, the idea of post-structuralism, the idea of challenging assimilation were beginning to come together. So at one level, you've got this sort of post-structuralist uh, uh, perspective of uh, the way that we are is constantly, you know, people are, dis the, the discourse becomes important, texts become important, words on a page are actually what constitute bodies and meanings, yeah? So that becomes a really interesting time because Judith Butler flows in and we begin to break, for the first time, begin to break this binary of what does gender actually mean? You know, what, how, how are bodies? male and female. What does it mean to say somebody is a boy and somebody is a girl? You know, Judith Butler's work was really profoundly influential, even though there's a lot of critique from Cole's work. You know, these post you know, lots of other people, but post-structuralism, this radical queer politics that began to emerge, but it was still critiqued on the basis that maybe it's too radical. There's still a mainstream of people, a status quo of people, who simply want, maybe, to access therapy and, the, and, and, and actually just be able to talk about issues. It might not be that everybody wants to be radical and at the edge of 
of, of, of changing the world and uh, uh, taking up radical queer politics. And now we've got maybe more recently the emergence of a trans, uh, a, a trans epistemology really, a shift towards what do we mean by by sexed bodies, even in in, in more uh, more ways of thinking. This idea of gender variance in a recent study. Uh, in Brighton, and in equally a few, there's a Tumblr site called Gender, Fee, Gender Queer Confessions, you'll see, I, I mean, I found 28 and more now labels for how young people are beginning to name their body. It's, you know, I ought to be a demi-boy, a demi-girl, a mask romantic, a pansexual, a agender, bi-gender, cisgender, um, uh, any number of words that begin to flow through. And what does this mean? about the way that we are going to be thinking about bodies. And certainly in therapy, we're struggling to find a language. Because we can't take for granted, I certainly can't, I have, I have people who walk through the door whose name may usually be defined as masculine, but they present as possibly, well, what would be taken as feminine, which is problematic as a, com as a, as a term in, in itself. But how do you work with somebody who may say to me, well, my partner, he's actually uh, going to be seeing him this weekend. And then maybe later on you, you realise that the person that they're talking about was actually um, labelled female at birth. So assigned female at birth, assigned masculine at birth. And these things actually then completely mean that your way of thinking about gender about the work that's been presented, usually on courses, is very problematic. And e even more so is the fact that now we do need to find a way to think about things like informed consent. See, bodies are undergoing these seismic changes, really. Massive changes are going on. Some people come along and they say, well, actually, you know, I'm thinking of, like, really, I'd like some hormones. I don't, I don't actually want surgery, and I don't want hormones to change me from the gender I was assigned, the sex I was assigned at birth, but I want to take some hormones. I don't really want to even have to go to a gender identity clinic in order to get that. I want to be able to go to maybe a sexual health clinic, where actually in Canada or in Australia, people can go and actually um, refer themselves, and through a, a, an informed consent model, people can sit down and negotiate what it means to actually use particular hormones. Whereas in the UK at the moment, that's probably quite unprecedented, although there may well be some shifts and changes along the way. So it's just to give a sort of a, a, a very brief outline. Sage have got a, a, a handy little thick book, which I wouldn't bother buying, but I'd ask your library to get it, coming out at some point this year, which is an encyclopedia, if you go to Sage, it seems to do everything, don't it? So a Sage encyclopedia of uh, LGBTQ. Uh, uh, psychology of working with people in, in, uh, in, in tr trans and it's a great book in some ways uh, because it, it does cover a lot of material that I think has tried to make it quite contemporary so, um, so there we go that's that one. but the fight for recognition within therapy continues and it really is a bit of a blast really because actually over the years, probably about the 15 years but really now we're actually looking at probably 20 because I'm not familiar with it um, doctoral level therapists are, uh, who have been, you know, the trend con is really about seven years, I would think, from the moment that they do their undergrad and they come out at the other end of the, of the doctor. But during that whole seven years, they're likely to only get between two and uh, 16 hours of teaching, not so much just about gender and sexuality, but about heritage, uh, ethnicity, disability, or able-bodiedness, uh, gender, sexuality, class, all of those things, all thrown in together uh, into this sort of ghettoization. Uh, and so there comes about a fight for recognition, and the politics of recognition are actually quite interesting, I think. But part of the work in, in that means that what does it mean about pedagogy? What does it mean about the way we form knowledge? What does it mean about the way that therapists, or maybe you or any of us, how do we form knowledge about the people that we're actually researching or the people that we're actually working with? And Pierre Bourdieu talks at length about uh, not just 
including the politics of recognition, but the idea of pedagogy and the idea of the dominant group. How do we, how, how does this process of inferiorization of the other, how does that operate? How, how do we go about dominating and oppressing without even realizing it? Without even understanding that what we're doing is that, that actually what he refers to is a form of symbolic violence. There is a silent form of violence, great and gentler than physical violence, but no less real. Because in a way, what we begin to possibly do, and certainly I experience this or have done in therapy, well, I'm still do really, uh, is that there are this a system of meaning. A uh, system of symbolism and a system of meaning, or i.e., a culture uh, is constructed and it, it's placed upon groups of certain classes, but it's done in such a way that nobody quite realizes it necessarily. That in some ways we all experience <coughs> it as completely legitimate. So, in therapy, the fact that maybe people haven't really had an understanding of what it means to work with people who are queer or trans is problematic, but they won't necessarily see it as that. None of us recognise it as that, because after all, we've had a decent teaching, it's been a useful course, people have got the doctorates, what is there to argue about? So, this idea of intersectionality is one that's flown around, I'm sure you, you might have come across it, the idea of these different systems of oppression how do we actually, uh, how do we intersect? So I, I, I can't stand here and turn around to you and say I, I, that my privilege as a white person doesn't have any impact, A, on the research, B, on my thinking, C, on where I live, D, on anything that I do in my everyday life. Because it does, so think about what does that mean for you? How, do, how are you embedded? in different systems. What does it actually mean then for you to maybe say, well, I'm a man or I'm a woman, I'm white, I'm from a, a Southeast Asian heritage, I'm uh, disabled. I mean, certainly when I became, uh, I, I don't class myself as disabled because I've taken up that sort of official status, but walking around with a stick has certainly altered, A, my life, but B, the reactions that people have to me. Some of them nice, in fact most of them nice, in London I think we're pretty lucky. But really I live in London and it's a very privileged place. I, don't, I can walk into a cafe and not feel like I have to ask for a, any help to get to a, a toilet that's upstairs. The fact that when I get there it might be male or female is another issue, but the issue of actually getting to the toilet of yourself is actually, you know, people have gone out of their way to make sure that, you know, we can walk in. I don't want to have to feel like somehow I'm a bit different. And I suppose part of it is how do all your different types of identity intersect? How are they laminated on each other? And then how do you then think about your research? How have you gone out and thought about the way that research is conducted, how it will have an impact? what it will mean about treatment, diagnosis, different pathways, different teams, what happens when the queer person walks in, what happens when the trans person walks in who's got a mental health issue and actually wants treatment uh, for, the, for, the, for gender reassignment, but equally may have other issues that actually are also being presented. It, it's none of these things, and of course, the, the different ways of, of intersecting mean that diff people take all sorts of different positions. And it means that we think about our different methodologies, about how to understand people in the world. In a past life, I was quantitative, and now I'm qualitative. I'm qualitative because I like stories. I like your stories, I like my stories. I like people's stories because I think they're interesting. But more than that, that people are immersed in a social life. The fact that I can go out and do a diagnosis on somebody and make them whatever it is that they are, is very, very powerful. I have to understand this story in order to get to a point where I can lever a diagnosis into, into the making. And quite often, for example, if we talk about gender and gender identity, 
That simply doesn't happen. People's stories are possibly left out of the equation while they are tr go down a treatment pathway, meet with a psychologist, have an assessment, maybe then have to wait several months before they have another assessment because they might want hormone treatment or gender reassignment. And the role of psychology in that is incredibly important to think through. So how do we understand the subject? How do you go about forming a LGBTQI or a subject? What does it mean for the way we conduct research and diagnosis? What does it actually mean for the way that the research and diagnoses and treatments will, uh, will form their way into citizenship? How do we write about people? How do we, how do we actually form them? Praxeographics is a way of understanding the more micro actions that people have. And really, it seems to me that some of this is sort of embedded in our thinking about how we actually go about um, you know, assembling uh, uh, our way of thinking in relation to people. And just before I just go to this and focus about the emergence of trans, I just want to point out that you know part of the um, training that I do as a counselling psychologist over years, you've, I've tried to sort of <coughs> try to actually make sure that we become more representative because it seems quite important that training cohorts do reflect the wider society <coughs> that we are part of that actually we do understand that in the stories that people tell are ways of maybe understanding the importance of the way that we go about thinking in terms of research and uh, our contributions to um, uh, journals or uh, treatments or whatever that may be. And yet, actually, that's often not reflected and in my own uh, research showed on several occasions. Most trained cohorts weren't reflecting a wider social group. In fact, most people would say things, uh, as, I, as I found, which was, um, you know, it's mostly women, I would say it's probably 80% women on the courses, 80% white, middle class females, heterosexual, uh, they were all white, there were two blogs in the diploma group, one gay woman. Uh, somebody said that people were in their nice, close, sort of typically middle class world. They never thought of the pink triangle represented. And we have four men, all of whom were straight, and the rest were all, well, I would classify as middle class women, straight women. So it's tricky, because not only were they not straight, I was also not middle class. And finally, one person who identifies as mixed heritage with a and queer and bisexual said that people on their courses are training, fairly well known uh, relationship training course, uh, were heteronormative suburban housewives predominantly white people, I guess, some biblical sex problems. So there was a sort of a sense of what exactly, who, who can go out and work with people? What, what makes us think about what Anne-Marie Moll talks about, the logic of care? How do we think about care for pe the people that we work with? And what exactly that might mean when we're putting together by thinking about what this person needs. So more recently, just to sort of shoot up now into, into <clears throat> more recent um, areas of, uh, of research, we're at this sort of idea now that we've, we're actually looking at more the emergence of trans bodies. Not so much transsexual, but, <clears throat> but more in terms of transgressive transgender, some people who are transgender wouldn't want to be denoted as transsexual because people may feel that their body um, after gender reassignment is now the body uh, that they would want. So that's, uh, people may feel that actually uh, they are male or female. But there are a growing number of people um, that actually no, don't actually want to feel that they belong to a male or a female category. And that maybe sexing the body at birth is problematic because that's a jurisdiction, a legal statement that's made by somebody who simply looks maybe at genitalia. And even if we take it to further, 
more micro degrees of what's at a cellular level a body is, we still can look at a body in terms of how we've constructed meanings about it, in terms of male and female. And my own work often is about emotion and actually what does that mean in terms of bodies? Why are we describing in the main that men are like this and women are like that? Does it really, really make any sense? And believe me, you know, I've come from a psychological background, so there's plenty of neuropsychological evidence to tell you that there are men who think like this and women who think like that. Men who feel like this and women who feel like that. As somebody said at work, did you know it really has been proved that girls like pink and boys like blue. Well, there you go then. How can we argue with it? So, in terms of trans, we get maybe a more elusive sort of like challenging of binaries, a sense that these meanings for the body are now going through yet another seismic uh, shift. There's been certainly, in my experience in terms of, the, of therapy, you know, at one level, I work um, in research in trans and uh, uh, non-binary gender. Uh, and the change is massive. Sociologically, there's lots and lots of work being done. Uh, if you look on social media, uh, the, the work has been phenomenal. Tobias Rowan, who's down at Roskilde University, has done this fantastic little article on doing your self-therapy, fantastic PhD, if you feel like going that way and, and reading stuff. Really very much about you know, how the world is changing, how you probably now interact at all sorts of levels, things that I never did, you know, with Facebook and uh, Twitter and the, 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 the just the blogs and the advent of social media has shifted the meanings for bodies in, it, so that young people now no longer wish to just use labels like male and female. And this, this means that we have to rethink maybe these binaries and why they're so problematic. Uh, you know, yes, there has been some shifts and change, but in the main, people tend to want to, to stay in them. It's, it's sort of like <coughs> interrogating ourselves is maybe a little bit a little bit touchy feely, a little bit Ooh, don't really know about that. I am I am this and I am that. We like our essentialisms. You know, I, I am definitely this. It's like, well maybe you're not, you know, what would happen if you just were to think differently for a day or wear different clothes for a day or you know, give yourself different pronouns. I often like to have different pronouns, I like to call myself Iggy, I'm, I probably would take a different avenue about my body in, uh, if I was younger. It's, it's you know, I, I, have, I don't think we should be as precious as we are about certain things, and things need to maybe sometimes uh, be rethought. Um, so that idea of uh, breaking, ba breaking binaries is, um, more and more showing that within sociology, the work that's done with Pierce, who's over at Warwick, who I work with, is just finishing a PhD on trans healthcare. Trans healthcare is now moving into all sorts of different dimensions, but that means that sexual health and uh, bodies are beginning to overlap. Uh, and Clinic Q, for example, that's down in Soho, works with a lot of people who identify as trans and non-binary gender, uh, and it's a sexual health clinic. And part of that is really important because people should be able to access fairly easily um, areas where they want to discuss their body and maybe what actually it might mean for them in, some, uh, in, in a large number of cases. So, you know, this is, that's just a, a sort of, I mean, hopefully you can, uh, you can have this uh, these slides if they have any interest for you. But, um, you know, do you have a clear gender identity as a woman or as a man? How do you identify? What does your gender mean for you? What does your body actually mean for you? How do you denote that you are a woman or you are a man? Is it because of what you do, what you feel? Is it through genitalia? Is it through uh, who you fancy? Is it through who fancies you? You know, how do you actually really establish your sexuality, your gender, and, the, and your sex body? How do all these things shift and move together, do you think? Yeah. Oh, I don't know what's on. Thank you. 
Um, so gender queer is a well. I was just giving, trying to give you an example of, a, of an alternative way that people might use as a way of defining the body, um, and that it's um, you know that we actually have these more detailed labels. Uh, but you, but gender queer, you don't have to define yourself as a gender. And what does it mean, you see, if you're if you if you know wherever you go and work after here. What will it mean if somebody comes to you and says, well, I don't define as a gender? And you can't quite tell, you know, is this person, is this person mad? I mean, what are they? And, and they, they say, well, I'm gender queer. What will that mean for the work that you do and how you actually approach a person? Um, I mean, some people don't even want, I've got friends who are agender. I mean, lots of different, if you go on gender queer confessions, there's lots of labels. What does it mean? for you, and how do you define your gender? How do you fit these alongside these meanings, these labels, alongside the way that you have constructed your understanding of your gender? And is there a, a sense of, of well, I'm, I'm sort of a bit more normal than these, you know, how do you actually see it? What's normality, what does that mean? Ambiguity, liminality, mixing gender cues, what does it mean for internal identity? You know, the idea of queer plasticity, just the idea of no longer being able to say he and she. That if you were to say when you walk through the door that for tomorrow you're not going to, you would like to tell people that actually I don't want you to refer to me as he or she, I'd like you to refer to me as they, and how that would be experienced, A, by you, and B, by whoever you spoke to about it. And equally, why would you assume that people don't want to be a they? Maybe people do, and maybe every day people want, some people change the understanding of the ide identity on a daily basis. That's just a little bit to say. What do you say? And the um, beauty of trans is that it just basically is about, I think, altering or challenging structures. And so nothing can really remain the same. I worked in alcohol and drugs for about 22 years, I think it was. And predominantly people who came through the door were always defined in a particular way. It was just taken for granted. People were this and people were that. But when I work in those ex places, in the national health or the voluntary sector, then it's part of my responsibility to make sure that it opens doors to people who actually don't wish to identify in that particular way and that they're not pathologised as a consequence. So it's about renegotiating maybe subjectivity. What does it, I've already talked about GICs in that way, but actually that idea of informed consent is a much more collaborative way of working with somebody. Just to finish up, I'm just going to go again. Just to finish off, yeah, I'm involved in different things. I've tried to get involved in social justice and inclusion at the BPS. The Memorandum of Understanding should hopefully be signed later on this year. There's been a little bit of a thing called um, a referendum that's sort of not anything out of plan. So um, the Memorandum of Understanding hopefully will get signed later on this year. That's all the therapy organisations in the UK finally coming together. We signed the Memorandum of Understanding last year against conversion therapies around sexual orientation. Now it will be renewed uh, in relation to trans and asexuality and non-binary gender. Uh, the guidelines for working therapeutically with gender and sexual minorities is a document that the BPS have produced. The Gender Diversity Working Group is presently working on what's happening within the gender identity clinics predominantly, because there's a level of specialisation. Uh, trans people uh, are feeling that sometimes people don't necessarily know a great deal about trans matters. So some so some of the uh, uh, Royal College of Psychiatrists and the General uh, 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 GMC, uh, what is it, sorry, uh, gosh, oh, absolutely gone there, sorry, BPS, a number of other organisations, Royal College of Nursing, they're trying to get together to form a level of specialisation. And uh, the training, Committee for Training Curriculum Development is to see how things are monitored to make sure that certain changes, changes at a level of training and curriculum development in the British Psychological Society are developed 
so that uh, students actually have a broader training and go out uh, with more than two to 16 hours of training in difference. And that was just something that I rather liked. I thought it was an oh, ethical idea, isn't it, that maybe we should sometimes think about. In that uh, sometimes we have to rethink how we go about things. And that's it. Really. Sorry, it's been a few minutes over. Is that right? It's not very far. No, no, it's fine. It's still good. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. that was great, everyone can identify in sort of thousands of different ways. Yeah. I just wondered what your thoughts were on the argument that um, fundamentally, if someone has a Y chromosome, they are male, whether, whether you'd agree with that kind of that kind of identifying, and also, and if not, what would you call it? Because you can't get away from the fact that half the population don't have a Y chromosome and half the population do. So I was just wondering how that comes into it. I think the idea that people have certain chromosomes and maybe lack certain chromosomes and I suppose if you've read Anne Faust or Sterling's work you'll see that the work on sex gender is really immensely interesting in Myra Hurd's work so um, I think it's, it's you know the, the chromosome issue is one thing it's I think the other issue is how having chromosomes certain in certain patterns designates people into certain categories so that in, for example if if somebody has a is X Y chromosome, then what does that actually mean in terms of a wider, more expansive way of being able to think about the way that that body inhabits a social world? I think the the the, the problem isn't been so much the chromosomes as the way that certain ways of expecting bodies to be in the world has been narrowed down and bodies probably aren't really like that they probably are incredibly expansive and and you know I, in my work around emotion i don't think we could i mean i'm I mean a bit uh, reductionist but if we were to say this population of people are nurturing and caring and blah 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 and this population of people are, are uh, uh, aggressive and uh, um, strong and whatever these things might mean of itself is it's the citizenship of what that might mean it's the it's the way it inhabits certain social spaces so that one population are subjugated and and maybe you know it's it's not so much the chromosomes as so much as maybe how we've how how we've imposed certain meanings onto things that's that's my thought about it that's, that's good. Any more? Um, I know in the media quite a lot recently there's been a lot of talk about oh sorry, no, sorry. <laughs> I know in the media recently there's been quite a lot of talk about what age if, if you identify as trans um, mm. when you're older mm. um, does that also apply to a child that is under the age of consent to consent to say um, in their trials do you think that well, would be something that we what is your stance on how young yeah. you should be to decide these sorts of quite fundamental decisions about your <coughs> own sexuality and body well, sexuality, uh, um, uh, maybe uh, that maybe that's sort of negotiated, maybe in different ways, and we come later on the sex body. Um, I think it's always a bit controversial when we, uh, we talked about children, and um, but then Det who's the chief psychologist at the TAVI, is quite clear that maybe there are a lot of young people who feel or who say that their bodies don't feel right and that what they do is try to delay puberty until the point where they can decide for themselves what they want. I think that's one avenue. Um, I'm not sure about whether or not, you see I, I can't say, there are people who would adamantly say that's the avenue they want to go down and that that's where they should have gone down when they were 
younger in retrospect. So that's that. There's a population of people. When I was younger, I was always I was always defined as a tomboy, and I actually think that I haven't ever. Well, it's a bit difficult with because I don't I don't live in this time now. I live in the time that I had this body. So, in some ways, I, my sense is that if society, and that's why the Swedish experiment really is interesting, if the society that we live in didn't reduce everything to such, well, didn't, didn't have such narrow labels and was able to, you know, congregate around a more expansive way of thinking, a lot of young people may feel that they're non-binary gender. That's, I would say I was probably a gender variant child, but I would say I was a gender variant child because I did things that were, you know, the, certain roles that I did. I like playing football, I like climbing trees. I didn't think I was male or female, it was just I had a body, and this is what I wanted to do with it. So my feeling is we, we really have a long way to go on our thinking about young bodies. And I would feel that I would want to take that very, very seriously and very, very sensitively. Because I am really aware of people that I work with now who are in their 30s and 40s who say, I was born into the wrong body. And I wish I had treatment when I was a child. But other people, it's a narrative. See, there's, it clashes with a lot of narratives. There's a lot of narratives that equally say wrong body narratives. And the wrong body narratives are displayed all over the television or, or different forms of media. It's often, and, you know, we're talking to Chris, and Chris was born in the wrong body. And, da, 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 da. and you know, they do incredibly good pieces of work, but it's not the only narrative. And a lot of young people equally say now, um, actually, I just don't want these labels. I want to dress or live in the way they want. It's a bit like that. So, but in terms of, um, I, I just feel like I would um, not have wanted to. You know, my, if my mum and dad had have thought, oh my God, my child being a real tomboy, we need to get them some psychological help and and whatever. Maybe maybe I would have needed that for lots of different reasons, but I'm not sure that. Now I would have appreciated it, but who's to know? It because I didn't have that choice. So it's it's. I think probably Bernadette Rem would be a good person to actually discuss this with because she, as the chief psychologist and that works with new people in that psychological setting, there's also mermaids as well. And they have a very distinct voice about this. Is that all right? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah. 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 Um, I was just wondering, there's a paper recently that just came out in The Lancet suggesting yeah. that um, that trans could be taken out of the DSM. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, I was wondering what you think the consequences of doing that might be for services and support well, for trans. Well, in one way that would be very good if it was no longer classed as a mental health issue, but like going back to homosexuality, yeah. you know? Um, However, some people, certainly more in America, might need it for insurance. Here, it does give a certain treatment pathway. It's a bit, it, it's a bit, it's a bit interesting. Very political, this actually, because I think a lot of people that are trans don't want to have to have a mental health label with them, but they do want treatment. And but you see, you shouldn't have to designate a label in order for a person to get treatment. And about, and, and apparently, the money is about to be released, but mainly to the gender identity clinics. I think that, if you want my opinion, I think there needs to be a complete overhaul of the way that we understand gender, sex, and sexuality, but predominantly gender. I don't think it needs to be isolated into gender identity clinics. I think that they need to have power devolved, and I think a lot of sexual health clinics could actually do a lot of that work. And that the best models to look at, not, not perfect, but really moving forward, are in Australia and Canada. And I think those are the models that we should try and work towards so that people can self-refer, but they, they're funded centrally. Does that help? Yeah, that does. Thank you. Lovely. Is that Thanks, right? Al. Thank you very much, everybody, for sitting and listening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, we'll have a little break and back in some water. Yeah. Thank so you. Guys. So